cold plunges, ice baths. They are all the hype right now in the fitness world, in the health and fitness world. Everybody's doing them. Everybody's doing them. Uh, all your favorite athletes, all your favorite coaches. You got Wim Hof, Andrew Huberman, Joe Rogan. All your favorite athletes are doing cold plunges and ice baths. And so they're just all the hype right now. Now, with those cold plunges and ice baths, there's all kinds of ways to do them. And you can keep it as simple as just buying a bunch of ice and put it in your bathtub. You can buy some uh, troughs from like a feed store, them big aluminum troughs, uh, put ice in those. You can buy barrels, put them in them outside. I ended up messing around and buying a cheap little tub off Amazon and because I, I want to do my cold plunges outside. So I bought that. Didn't do very well in the North Carolina heat in the North Carolina summer. I was having to refill it with water. I was having to buy, you know, bags of ice about $8 worth a day to get it to around 50, 55 degrees. And then of course it would heat up really quickly. And um, so I wanted to mess around with doing ice baths and cold plunges and I actually actually ended up really enjoying it. So I was like, man, let me mess around with this a little bit longer. I wanna do, you know, at least six months of it and see what kind of benefits I get, see how I feel from it. And plus I really like it. So I need to find a more sustainable way to do the plunges versus spending $8 a day on ice. That comes out to $240 a month. You can do the math, how much that's gonna cost you per year. So I was like, okay, I can, so I started going down the rabbit hole and there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of different types of cold plunges that you can do out there. And as soon as you start to go down this rabbit hole, you'll see there's so many different types, but I tried to find the most economical type. And so I went with a chest freezer conversion. Now, my wife would not allow me to put a white chest freezer on the back deck. And to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't want a white chest freezer out there either. So I wanted something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. So I built an enclosure around mine. So I wanna do a little video, show y'all what I built, give you some ideas on your cold plunge that you decide to build for yourself. All right, I'm gonna give you a quick visual on the process of what I did. First thing I did was buy all the materials, get the freezer on order, and then I went ahead and built the frame. So the first thing I did is build the frame, starting with the top. So what you see on the bottom there is actually the top. And the reason why I did that is so it would be easy for me to make sure that inside perimeter would fit my fridge exactly. So that inside perimeter of your actual one by sixes there. So you see two by fours and then you see one by sixes. The one by sixes on the bottom are actually that the, the inside perimeter of that is going to fit directly around your fridge. So they should match. The now I did not the fasten fridge. those one by sixes down there at the bottom. I didn't fasten to the frame. So then I just remove them out and boom there goes my frame so i built that frame first i got all my latches built then i came in and i started to put the exterior boards on i cut out my holes for the vents in the side on both sides put my vents on assembled all the boards and then i got the freezer i taped everything up removed all the hinges all that i got to sanding the interior after i sanded i went in and used alcohol to clean the inside uh, then after that i came behind after cleaning and i well then i removed all the hinges and everything but after that i sealed it up so i used the jb weld to seal the interior um here i am just talking about how I, my Fridge lid is very flat, and so that's a good type of lid to have if you're gonna actually build wood over top of it like I did with mine because everything's flat, so you can just nail everything to the top of the freezer. Um, the fridge is okay to drill into and to nail into. So just showing that a little bit there, and uh, some types of freezers may be a little bit more difficult to work around. All right, so then after I got everything sealed up on the inside, you can see I got the JB weld, JB water weld. That's all you should use to seal the interior, let it cure up, and then you're gonna prime the inside. All right, you're gonna buy some self etching primer from Tricolor and you're gonna prime the inside. I did two, it took two cans of primer, two coats of primer after. I finish with the primer, let it dry, let it seal up, and then you're gonna use your pond shield. So now you're gonna come in behind with your pond shield. 
All right, read the directions very well on it. Make sure you're not in over 50% or 55% humidity. If you live in the South, I put on four coats of this stuff, but that's the sealant that you need, that pond shield. It's a non-toxic shield to seal up the inside of your freezer. Mine worked fantastic for me. All right, now here is the finished product when I got done sealing everything up. And now we're gonna look at the inside of the enclosure. What you're gonna to wanna to do is before you put your chest freezer inside of that enclosure, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and map out all your wires, get everything run, get everything ready, because once you get that chest freezer inside of there, you're not gonna have enough room. You're gonna have about six inches of space to work with, which is what I calculated to make sure that the freezer could breathe and cool itself properly. And so I went ahead and I, put, I bought that waterproof membrane up at the top. To, that way I could run it up and down the side so that way water wouldn't really get in, soak in through the top, leak in as much through the top and through the sides if rain was blowing in. But basically I wanted to keep all my wires off the floor. I didn't want anything on the ground. I didn't want any wire connections um, sitting on the deck where water could puddle up and pull up and get in them. So I got everything off the ground. So you're going to want to map everything out. Uh, go ahead and screw everything up to your board. So right there, I got my ink bird temperature gauge. I've got my surge protector. Uh, I don't have everything there that I ended up using at that point when I took the picture. I was on hold and waiting for some products to come in from Amazon. But you're just going to want to kind of map that out and plan that out, you know, um, just so that way you can get everything set up, get everything ready. Then what you're going to do is you're, you see that backboard on the frame. You're going to remove that backboard off the back side, and then you're going to take your chest freezer. And I went ahead and placed my chest freezer where I wanted it. And then I slid my frame and my enclosure around it. And then once it got around it, I put those backboards back on the back again to, to close it in. Of course, the back of my freezer is open. I've got that, that uh, cabinet liner, that mesh on the back side there. So that way my freezer can breathe. And also that stuff's super easy to remove. I just got it stapled in and it's cheap. So like if I need to, I can rip it off and go in and access my freezer, do whatever I need to do. So now I wanna get into some details about the chest freezer itself. And let's talk about the exterior first. Is I wanted the top of it to be flush or close to flush with the top of my freezer. So when you measure for your freezer dimensions, remember you're gonna want some nice support underneath the freezer. I've got two by fours under mine. So I had to take that measurement on the two by fours and add that to the height of my freezer. I had to get the height of my freezer without the lid to make sure that my frame and my enclosure match the height of the inside. Not a super big deal though, because you can always use shims and things to try to get your, your freezer to the right height and to get this to the right height. So not a real super big deal there, but you wanna be pretty close. And then the next thing that was super important is that when building an enclosure, you know, these freezers are not meant to be, to have things wrapped around them. Um, they need at least six inches of space to be able to cool properly. As they are pulling heat out of the inside, the outside of your freezer will get really hot. My freezer's garage ready, so it's ready to, to withstand some pretty high temperatures, but it's max temperature is 115 degrees. And in the North Carolina heat on my back deck, as you can see, you know, we're getting quite a few hours of direct sunlight here. The sun is starting to, to go over the house and get a little bit of shade, but it gets a lot of sunlight here. So I knew it was going to need plenty of ventilation. So I allowed for six inches all around the outside of, of airspace so that way it can cool properly. Now the back of my chest freezer is open and it does have just some mesh across the back so it is fully open but then you've got six inches around on each side i did also build vents in on each side so you get a little bit of ventilation so you can see i've got vents on both sides there my lid i wasn't sure exactly how i was going to do the lid because i didn't follow any kind of plans for this this was all just made up on my own and so I wasn't sure if I was going to let the lid hinge up or if I was going to just take the hinges off and do a completely removable lid. And I found that it was just easier for me because I'm not by any means any kind of like expert carpenter or anything like that. And so for me, it was easier to just 
create the lid in a way that I could just remove the lid. So I took all the hinges off the lid. I took the handle off the lid. I actually painted the bottom of my lid flat here. And then I just took these boards and I fastened all the boards directly to the lid. I used wood glue and I had a nail gun and nailed everything in. And that leads me to like, for this DIY project, you know, there were some tools that I already had, like, you know, an air compressor, nail gun, miter saw, and build this. But I don't have anything crazy. Like, I mean, I don't, have, you know, I'm not like a master woodworker or nothing like that. So really some basic saws. I mean, you don't even need nail gun. Nail gun made it a lot easier for sure. I had some clamps to be able to clamp up my boards and, and get them set right, but that's about it. So my lid here, it does fully removed completely off okay and you can see that my fr my freezer sits inside and it's pretty close to being flush pretty close to being flush on the inside all right i'm gonna unplug this and turn it on and it's uh JBL headphones on Amazon, man. They are cheap, but fantastic little earbuds. Things are great. I'm gonna set this thing out here in the sun. Hopefully it's waterproof, water resistant enough. Here's my filter that I got from Marine Land. It's super simple. You just plug it into the wall. I got it plugged into my main surge protector that has like all my filters plugged up on it and my freezer plugged up on it. And you just set it in the water, turn it on the power, and then it's good to go. Now, I also did buy a UV filter, this Green Machine UV filter. I may have messed up there. I didn't want to mess with ozone. Um, ozone seems like it could be pretty complicated and a lot of people run into issues. And I thought UV would be easier, but Come to find out UV can actually be a little bit complicated as well. So I bought this UV filter, it's about a hundred bucks. Um, just trying to get out easy. And I don't think this is really adequate. It can help keep your water nice and clear, but it doesn't really kill those like microorganisms. So um, I ended up having to go with hydrogen. And so now I use hydrogen peroxide food grade, hydrogen peroxide that's like 35%. And that, is my sanitation. I've got filtration with Marine Land filter, then I've got UV for sanitation and keeping the water clear, and then I've got hydrogen peroxide for keeping the water clear as well. And that's 35% food grade. I uh, will have all the stuff linked in the description. So make sure your power is always off on everything. I don't even like to put my hands in the water unless the power is off. I mean, this thing could potentially shock you don't want to mess around with electricity there this thing could potentially get you well let's talk about how I have everything wired up so I've got two temperature controllers okay I've got one temperature controller that is the main temperature controller that runs the whole entire setup so I have an extension cord and that extension cord goes runs to my safety cutoff temperature controller. That's an Inkbird. It's the Wi-Fi temperature controller. And I've got the temperature gauge, the thermometer, mounted to the side of my chest freezer. Okay, so I've got that mounted to the side of the chest freezer. I've got that there so that way if this thing heats up past 115 degrees, it'll cut off the whole entire system. It's gonna cut everything off and it's Wi-Fi, so it's gonna alert me on my phone and I'm gonna be able to see what's going on and I'm gonna know that everything's off and I'm gonna know that everything's overheating. This particular freezer is rated, it's garage ready and it's rated for 115 degrees. So that's where I got the cutoff set. At. Now, after that, my surge protector that you saw that's mounted inside of the enclosure here, that surge protector is plugged into the heating side of that ink bird. Okay, it's plugged into the heating side of the ink bird that is mounted to the side of the freezer. 
I've got that setting at 115 degrees. So what it's gonna do is activate that outlet, and keep that outlet hot, keep that outlet activated until this thing hits 115 degrees and then that's when it will shut it off essentially. So my surge protector's plugged into that heating side of that anchor. Now my surge protector runs and it's got four, um, it's got four outlets on that particular surge protector. Now on that surge protector, I have my two, my UV filter plugged in and my marine land filter plugged in. Uh, Cause I want those things running all the time. I want those running all the time. So they're plugged directly into the surge protector. Now the third thing I have plugged into the surge protector is my other ink bird temperature controller that is waterproof. And so it has a waterproof thermometer on it that, that's submersible. So it goes down in my actual water, okay? And that is going to, uh, I actually have my freezer plugged in to that ink bird temperature controller. So that way, when my freezer hits the water temperature that I want, when it hits the water temperature that I have it set on, it's going to click my freezer off. So only my freezer is plugged into that ink bird and everything else, my filters stay on, my filters stay working, but the freezer itself actually shuts off when it stays at that temperature. So that's essentially how I have everything wired up inside. Um, so I talked about the enclosure, I talked about the outside, I talked about the wiring, I've got the back side open. Um, I don't know really what else I have to talk about. So um, I've got all the items listed in the description. I've also got a DIY plan on my website so you can get that document and get everything. I'm not an expert in this. I definitely don't know everything there is to know about these. John Richter, um, his DIY chess freezer website and his Facebook group are great resources that you can use, um, that you can find all kinds of information on chess freezers. Um, this is my first one, this is my first build. So I will say, make sure when you're cutting, measure twice, cut once. I did make some errors when I was cutting. I, did, I made some errors on the pond shield. My humidity was really bad here. And um, so it started to bubble up a little bit. And, make you know make sure that you're when you do your pond shield you're inside in a controlled climate not a ton of humidity or at least it's beautiful weather where you are um, not too hot not too cold not too humid yeah make sure you unplug your unit like do not get in this thing while do not get in this thing while it's plugged in don't get in while any of that stuff is plugged in i've got it set up where i can just pull my plug and nothing nothing is energized here um, at all so it's uh, pretty safe once once I do that. It's a lot of ways to do a cold plunge. There's tons of ways other than a chest freezer. And again, I chose the chest freezer because for me, it seemed like the most economical way. You can do um, with a chiller, and you can get a feed tub from Tractor Supply and a chiller, and you can build the same type of setup with that. Um, I was a little bit worried and nervous about buying a chiller because some of the chillers are 1400 bucks. some of the chillers people recommend. I knew this thing was going to be in the heat on the back deck and I was a little bit worried about a chiller. But I didn't want to spend 1500 on a chiller so I was looking at more like $500, $600 chillers and I was a little bit afraid that they wouldn't be able to keep up with the North Carolina heat. And so that's one of the main reasons I went with a chest freezer. I had seen some people had some chest freezers that held up in some pretty tough, hot conditions. So um, if you have any questions at all, feel free to hit me up in the comments. Please do me a favor and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, it'd help me a ton. I like to give out a lot of tons of fitness information, health information. I'm trying to start doing more reviews on products as well. So that helps me a ton watching good luck with your DIY cold plunge. In this part of the video, I wanna talk all business. We're gonna break down the money, the dollars, the Benjamin, the cash. We're gonna see how much it costed to build this cold plunge. Because for most of us, let's be honest, that's what really matters, how much does it cost? We're gonna break it down into three sections. We're gonna talk about the necessary. This is what you need if you're just gonna do a bare bones chest freezer. You don't care about how it looks. You don't care, you're, you're gonna drain and fill it every week. You don't care about leaving the water in there for two, three months. Then we're gonna talk about some of the other, other items in part two, like filters and sanitation and circulation and 
some other items for looks. In the third section, we will price the actual enclosure and how much all that lumber cost it if you wanna do an enclosure like that. So let's start off with the necessary. Number one, you're gonna need a freezer. And so the freezer I purchased was a 14 cubic foot Insignia Garage Ready, okay? All right, so there, there's three reasons why I purchased the freezer that I purchased. Number one, it was on sale for $349. <laughs> That's pretty cheap for a 14 cubic foot freezer. Uh, number two, 14 cubic foot was um, a decent size for me and what I needed. And then number three, it was garage ready. And I, and mine's in the direct sunlight and garage ready means that it's ready to operate in some extreme temperatures. Most freezers and fridges are designed to be, to work at around room temperature. This one's designed to be a little bit more extreme. So that's why I purchased that one. There are other great chest freezers. If you're really tall or if you're really broad, you may have to look into, you will have to look into buying a bigger freezer than I purchased. You could always, if you're not gonna go big and do all the extra things I did, you could always buy a used one. Uh, I just didn't wanna invest a bunch of money and time in the DIY project on a used uh, freezer that might conk out on me in three months. You're gonna want to buy a Inkbird water temperature control. It's an Inkbird temperature controller. All this stuff is gonna be linked here, but this one is has a submersible thermometer. So it can, the thermometer portion is made for aquariums, it's made to go underwater. You're gonna to wanna to get that. That's gonna control the actual water temperature. It's super easy. All you do is plug your freezer into the ink bird and then plug your ink bird into the wall, set it up. It's got instructions, super simple. Then it'll keep your water temperature at the temperature you want it to be at. If you don't have that, your water is just going to freeze up. Next, you're gonna need some sandpaper to sand the interior. 60 grit is probably about right. That's what I used. I had some already, but you might wanna purchase some. Pretty cheap. I had a sander. Obviously, it makes it a lot easier, a lot faster. Uh, you're gonna need some self-etching primer. Um, you actually need some rubbing alcohol too. I didn't have that listed. I already had some. I used rubbing alcohol to clean all the surfaces after I sanded it. And then you'll need some self-etching primer. All right, particularly the Duplicolor brand is really good. A lot of people speak highly of it. So I bought two cans of the self-etching primer because that's all my local store had is my local Napa store had two left. And so I bought two and it worked out because one can did about one coat, one can did the second coat. So I got two coats. $31.38 from Napa for those. Next, you're gonna need some sealant for the seams of the freezer. The freezer has seams all down the sides and all in the bottom. Look really closely for those. You're gonna to wanna to seal those up with JB Water Weld. What you're gonna do is take that JB Water Weld. It comes in almost like a, um, gosh, what's that stuff you used to play with when you are a kid? It's like little putty stuff. And you, you basically just roll it out. I rolled mine out into a really long string and I, and I could stretch it out maybe about this far and then you'll press it into those cracks and seams and flatten it out and push it in. Almost like caulking, but it's in there a little bit thicker and a little bit wider. You're gonna wanna do that and seal up all the seams. Seal up all the seams. Don't, don't skimp and use anything else. Don't use silicone. It took me 12 tubes, which is $73.20 on Amazon. Some people have had to use more than that, but for me, uh, in this particular freezer, I only needed 12 tubes. Next, you're going to need some sealant for the whole entire freezer. Now you could do a pond liner or, or a pool liner on the inside. Uh, John Richter on his website, which is linked in the description, he has, he makes some custom liners. Um, I didn't want the look of having a liner to me. They, they just don't look as good as the pond shield does. And uh, so looks came into play for me. So I applied the pond shield. You're gonna have to buy two kits of the pond shield. Now keep in mind, um, each kit contains two bottles, two or two cans, but they're two different. There's part A and part B and you're gonna have to mix them. So you're gonna actually need two kits to do four coats in this particular freezer. If you get a bigger freezer, you may need more sealant than that. Uh, it was $121.22 total on Amazon for that. Quick note, when you do it, don't let it, 
don't, when you put on your first coat of the pond shield, don't let it sit and set up for over 10 hours. If you do that, you're gonna have to sand it down so that way the next coat will seal up. I did mine about every hour and a half. Watch your humidity. I messed up. I did it in the humid, I did it in the heat, and it started to bubble up and had a little problem. So um, make sure that you put it in a temperature controlled, humidity controlled environment. Look up more details on that on John Richter's website or on Pond Shield's website. Ask them about it. I'm definitely not an expert on that, but I will say, you know, there are some ways you can mess up. But I did four coats, one coat every about an hour and a half. Uh, next, you're going to need rollers for the Pond Shield sealant. Um, I got a six pack from Lowe's, $11. I used one roller for each coat and that worked totally fine. Those actually rollers, seem they seem to work great. Then you're going to need four different containers to mix up the Pond sealant in. Um, you're you're going to have to each coat if you do five coats you're gonna need five containers and five rollers if you do six coats you're gonna need six you're gonna need one container per coat you're gonna need one roller per coat that you put on because once you let it sit there for an hour and a half it's gonna dry up inside of your container and on your roller it's really hard really fast you don't want to you don't want to mess with that so um, I got a link to some disposable inserts that you can buy that's what I used I already had a nifty little paint pail um, that I used so I just bought some inserts to put Side of it and those work really well make sure you get some paint stirs some stuff to stir the paint up or the pond shield up each time next i bought a outlet cover since mine's directly outside and it's going to be exposed in the rain and this thing's going to be plugged up all the time except for when i'm in it <laughs> so i wanted a cover outlet cover that i could leave the plug plugged in and still cover it up so i bought one of those 13.99 on amazon felt like that was pretty cheap and then uh, my next item here is actually not essential if you're gonna do a bare bones uh, setup, okay? This is only essential if you're gonna do the wooden enclosure or some kind of enclosure like I did. You're gonna want two vents on the side. You're gonna want vents so that there's a little more airflow, a little bit of circulation on the side. Uh, but so those two, I bought two of those for $40. I primed them, painted them the color that I wanted. They're black. Um, uh, I think they kind of look cool too. They give a little bit of color, a little bit of texture to the to the uh, to the enclosure itself. And uh, but obviously you're not going to need those if you're not doing an enclosure. So there we go. Total cost of all the necessary items for me was six hundred and seventy-seven dollars and seventy-seven cents. Now obviously. That could vary based on the freezer that you purchase. If you purchase a bigger freezer, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. My freezer was on sale. If you're going bare bones, and you wanna buy a used freezer off Facebook Marketplace for $75, you can come out a lot cheaper for sure. Well, let's go in and talk about the not absolutely necessary items that I chose to include in my type of setup. The first thing I think was really important because my freezer is in the direct sunlight. So I bought a Inkbird temperature control, a Wi-Fi temperature control for the exterior of my unit. So that way I could take that temperature control and mount it to the side of my freezer so it's up against the outside of my freezer where freezers get really hot as they cool. If they're really in a cooling cycle, they heat up on the outside. So if it's 97 degrees outside and the sun's beaming on my freezer and it's heating up, trying to cool the inside, it's got potential to get really hot. My freezer has a max operating temperature of 115 degrees. I realize in North Carolina heat, in that wood enclosure, in the direct sun with that freezer heating up, it's very possible that it could hit that temperature. Now, mind you, it is July right now and it has not hit that temperature yet, so I'm super glad. But I bought this temperature control as a safety cutoff. So that way, if it reads over 115 degrees on the outside of the freezer, it's gonna cut off my whole, cut off everything. I have the whole unit, all the electricity is running through that ink bird there. So it'll cut it off. And I could do the same thing in the winter time if I wanted to. If I didn't want it operating at 20 degrees, because sometimes that's not good for freezers, I can have a cutoff there so it cuts off and it's not running. Or I could have a heater hooked up and have the heater cut on when it gets that temperature or whatever. So I set that up. I thought that was a pretty good idea just to have that safety shut off there to protect my unit and of course to protect it from potentially burning up. For filtration and circulation, if you're gonna to wanna to leave your water in there for a decent amount of time, 
from what I understand and from what I've read about, you're gonna to want to have circulation, just like in a pool or a hot tub, you wanna have circulation, you wanna have filtration. Stagnant water is not good. So I bought this highly recommended Marine Land filter. It's got a pump and a filter built in. It's made for up to 97 gallons, which is good for my setup. And it's not a super big filter and it's super easy. It's just plug and play. You literally just put it in the water and then plug it up and it cuts on and it starts pumping and filtering through. Super easy, it's $87.65. Then for sanitation and bacteria control, you're gonna want some kind of san sanitation bacteria control. This area is totally new to me. I've never had a pool or a hot tub or anything like that. So like, I know nothing about this area. I just know pools, people use chlorine or brom bromine, bromine, have you said that? <laughs> so they use that. Uh, John Richter on his website recommends ozone. He's got a very specific ozone unit that they use. Ozone sanitize, sanitizes the tub, hot tubs. People use it for hot tubs a lot. Um, he recommends ozone. And I didn't go with ozone because I was a little bit afraid of it. I've seen where some people ran into some problems using it. And I took some bad advice off of a particular YouTube page on using UV. So I ended up trying to use UV in, to, for, to, for sanitation, UV filters instead of ozone. I think I made a mistake here, but I'll talk about that. I tried to salvage the mistake. So you may want to look into ozone. It's a little more pricey. Um, I wasn't really ready to spend that much. The unit I think is like $270, $280 or something like that. Not, I was already in as deep as I wanted to go on this and I did get some bad advice on the UV filter. So what I ended up buying is a green machine UV filter for aquariums. I thought this was gonna sanitize and kill microorganisms. What I found out is probably at that cheap of a UV filter, it's probably not really killing microorganisms. It's, but it will help keep your water clear. So I've got that $99 green machine UV filter for aquariums, but since I kind of messed up there, what I did is I went and got some 35% food grade hydrogen peroxide. I bought a gallon of this. You add it to the water to, for sanitation to help kill microorganisms. Um, I'm not really sure how effective that hydrogen peroxide is. I know a lot of people use it, but I'm definitely not an expert in sanitation. So, you know, chlorine or there, there's probably better options there. But I bought that one gallon for $62 and I feel like it should last me a year or more. Then I bought some hydrogen peroxide test strips because you want to measure those hydrogen peroxide levels in the water to see when you need to add um, any hydrogen in there. So that way I know uh, I can test it regularly. I bought a outdoor smart plug, uh, just a surge protector. I just wanted to buy one that was weatherproof. So I bought this one, I bought kind of a fancy one it's got remote control, timer, it's weatherproof, it's compatible with Alexa, Google Assistant. We got Alexa Echo in the house, so I bought it. Uh, not super necessary, but you're gonna have to have some kind of surge protector there. Uh, I would get a weatherproof one for sure. That one was $29.99. Then I bought some cord organizers. I mean, you could just use zip ties. I bought these because they, they're kind of easier to get off if I need to get them off than zip ties, but 10 bucks for four pack. Uh, they work really well, actually. Then you're, I bought some standard primer and black spray paint for the inside of the lid on my freezer because I wanted, you can barely see it in the pictures, but um, I wanted it to be black, so. Okay, and I got some cool lighting. I got two, two packs, so four lights. It was $54 total for submersible, waterproof, rechargeable LED lights. They switch to all kinds of different colors. With that being said, all those non-necessary items, that wraps up part two of this section. And all those non-necessary items costed $431.61 total. So now all the items so far, not including what's coming next, which is all the lumber and materials to do the enclosure. So far what we have is $1,109.38. So with that being said, let's move on to the lumber, the fasteners, the handles and other materials for that decorative enclosure around the exterior. Now 
note here, you know, you can obviously use different lumber choices. You're probably gonna need different amounts based on what freezer you use. Um, I know there's probably some way better lumber choices than what I used. I went pretty economical um, and then stained it. So uh, one key to remember here, when you build your enclosure, enclosure, you're gonna need at least six inches on every single side of that freezer. You do not want anything touching up against the freezer or super close to the freezer. Freezers are not meant to be insulated on the outside so you cannot cover them up. You have to let that heat come out of the freezer to cool the freezer down so it can work properly. Um, so you want that at least six inches on the side. So let's start with the frame. On the frame, I bought six uh, severe weather, two by fours, eight foot long, um, pressure treated lumber. I bought six of those, it was $36.08 total for them. And I bought three pressure treated one by ones, which are the middle braces. Um, I couldn't find the link, but these were around $3 a piece, so about $9 for those. Those are gonna be all your vertical braces, except for on the corners. The corners are gonna have two by fours, the bottom two by fours of the frame, top two by fours on the frame, and then in the middle of each side, you'll just have some of those one by ones, those little braces there. Now you can brace that up however you like. I've seen people do nothing but one by ones, but I want mine to be really sturdy because, you know, I'm getting on and off that thing, putting my whole body weight on it, right? I'm gonna be moving it around potentially if I have to move or whatever. I want it to be really sturdy, and uh, which is pretty heavy too. Then I, that was $9 for those. Then I bought four one by sixes um, at one by sixes. They were eight foot long. Uh, for, this is for the top, the top of the enclosure that boxes in the freezer, that top part that's flush with the top of the freezer. Um, I bought four of those. They were eight foot long. Um, I just bought severe weather pressure treated pine. Then I bought eight of these thick L brackets, braces needed for sturdiness and strength. You're gonna to wanna to do all the corners. You're gonna to wanna to brace everything up as much as possible. That's all at your discretion, but again, I wanted mine to be really sturdy. $36.64 for those. Um, I don't know if I mentioned for the one by sixes, they were $22.56 and then the small L brackets, I bought two packs of those. They were $5 total. And then you're gonna need some two and a half inch nails or screws or however you wanna secure the frame. And then for the exterior visible part of the enclosure, you're just gonna need 20 boards total. 20 one by four by eights. My store only had eight foot lengths, but it might come in handy if you can buy different lengths at your store to be more efficient and not waste. I kinda had to waste some wood there. And then that's all you're gonna need for the exterior as far as lumber, unless you're gonna do some trim pieces. I ended up doing some trim pieces later, but they're super cheap. You can pick out all kinds of cheap trim um, to, to make the outside look um, a little bit better. And then I don't think I spent but like $20 on my trim pieces at the most, so, and you can, yeah. So then uh, you're gonna need some finish nails. I already had some, but probably about five bucks for finish nails. And then I bought some clear stain for the wood. I did, it's gonna be in the sun, it's gonna be in the rain, I wanted to treat it. So I bought some clear stain. I wanted to keep that like light pond color. So I bought clear, I bought a gallon, $22. That gallon is probably gonna allow me to stain that thing seven times. I still have plenty of stain left. Then I purchased a waterproof membrane for the interior of the side of the enclosure that's gonna have all my electrical. And that membrane starts at the top, it goes up under where that top piece is and goes down the wall. But I bought that just to kind of protect all the electrical. I wanted all my electrical up off the floor and I wanted, you know, the least amount of water getting to it as possible. But I think, I think you'd be fine without it. But then I bought a mesh backside for the open part of the enclosure. I told you, you know, I wanted to keep the backside of my cold plunge open. And so I bought this actually shelf liner, cabinet liner from Lowe's that's slightly see-through. It's almost like mesh, it's rubber, um, and it's, 
it's just light. It's super easy to deal with. I just stapled it up on there. And that way you couldn't really see that open back part of my freezer. You, depending on like in my yard, that back side is not very visible. Uh, me or anybody else isn't gonna typically be on that side. So like that flat mesh does fine. It conceals it pretty well. But like you may wanna use something that conceals it a little bit better, but I would suggest using something that's still breathable. Um, so that way you, it helps in, you know, keep some airflow through the back the unit there you might have yours up against the wall and then you could just leave it totally open there and then i got barn handles for the lid i got a two pack of barn handles for the lid for eleven dollars and 59 cents off amazon those barn handles actually seem to work pretty nicely or pretty good total cost for the lumber and materials for the enclosure was $274.29. And then the that brings the total cost of the entire project to $1,383.67. Not too bad for a DIY uh, cold plunge, considering that some of them cost $5,000, $10,000. There's some chillers out there that cost $1,500. Uh, $3,000 just for the chillers. So, hey, I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you have any ideas, thoughts, questions, whatever, I'd love to hear from them. Please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and thank you so much for watching and tuning in. Good luck with your DIY cold plunge that you decide to build.